Kiitoksia. Great. Th thanks very much for asking me to uh, speak at this. It's a. Uh, uh, I guess what I was told was uh, sort of uh, I, I surmised as uh, a bit like that movie The Castle, you know, my name's Dale Kerrigan and here's my story, but I realised most of you were probably toddlers when that movie uh, was released. But basically what I uh, was asked to do was tell my story as to how I became a clinician scientist and about well, four years ago I was asked to give this lecture called The Greg Lecture at our college where you get the opportunity to talk about whatever you like, and I, that's what I chose to do. So I've deliberately left Greg Lecture 2015 uh, as the title for the slides, because Sir Norman McAllister Greg was uh, really a, a very important clinician scientist in ophthalmology. He was born in the western suburbs of Sydney. He went to school at Homebush Boys High School, which is at the end of the street where I've lived for the last 30 years. He did medicine at Sydney, trained in ophthalmology in the UK, and was a consultant at Prince Alfred and Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children. And my father-in-law was actually an ophthalmology student and then a clinical assistant with uh, Sir Norman McAllister Gregg. And his observation was that in his paediatric practice, he realised there was a massive increase in the number of congenital cataracts in 1941, and he realised that they looked different to other cataracts, and that it dawned on him that the mother, that there was been a rubella epidemic the year before, surveyed all his Australian colleagues, and found that 68 of the mothers uh, of these babies with congenital cataracts all had rubella and you know the rest was history and he was really the first of many great clinician scientists in ophthalmology and in medicine. So you know with me I, I grew up in the western suburbs in Granville and then in Concord West uh, my parents could never have sent me to university back then you won a Commonwealth scholarship to go to university and I did medicine at New South Wales Uni was an intern and a resident at St Vincent's and I was lucky enough to do the I term uh, as a resident and uh, that sort of resonated with me because they seemed to be the only patients that ever smiled when they left the hospital yeah, I made, tended to make every other patient I looked after sick or do some other terrible thing so I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? You know, physicians seem way too serious for me most of the time. Surgeons were a bit too gung-ho. <laughs> and uh, so I thought ophthalmology seemed pretty good, so I'll have a crack at that and, uh, you know, see how we go. So uh, I did my, uh, back then it was four years of eye training, so I did two at Prince Alfred, two at the eye hospital. And by that stage I was married and my father-in-law was actually that ophthalmologist uh, uh, that worked with Sir Norman and so I went into his private practice in Campsie in the inner west. But within a few months of working there, just as uh, I've forgotten whether it was Carol or, or Gemma said that I realised, you know, being in uh, private practice and seeing dry eyes and itchy eyes and burny eyes and more dry eyes and occasionally someone who had something wrong with them wasn't necessarily <laughs> <laughs> going to be fulfilling for me over the next 30 years. I realised I missed the hospital environment, or, you know, the acute stuff and systemic disease and all of this. I wanted more. But the problem was, uh, at the end of my training at the eye hospital, one of the consultants, uh, who was actually still there when I went back, told me that my future lay outside of the eye hospital. So I thought, okay, that's very interesting. And I guess my talk then shows you really what fantastic advice that turned out to be. So I'd always been interested in immunology and uh, they always seemed to be really smart physicians, no uh, disrespect to my <laughs> colleagues here. So I went back to see my mentor from when I was a, a, an intern and a resident, Ron Penny, and I knew Ron was interested at that stage in eye disease. He had a PhD student, Dennis Wakefield, who was looking at B27 related eye disease. So Ron said, look, go find another eye disease that we don't know much about and then come back and talk to me. And so... Back then, uh, this is a prehistoric form of podcast called a cassette deck, and uh, that's how we used to sort of uh, get updates in medicine, and I used to really enjoy listening to them in the car and driving my children mad. But uh, one, of the, one of the people I really enjoyed listening to was this guy called Stephen Foster, who's now a good friend of mine. And Steve was talking about how the fact that patients who got this really rare disease, scleritis, used to die, and 50% of them would die within five years of diagnosis if they didn't have, back then, what was very primitive uh, systemic immunosuppressive therapy. 
And Steve used to send his fluoritis patients when he didn't know what to do with them uh, at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Hospital over to Cambridge to see the guy who wrote this book, Peter Watson. And uh, the book was out of print by the time I tried to get one. And uh, But I eventually found a copy and read it and thought, oh, it's a really interesting inflammatory disease that involves the sclera, the white coat of the eye, uh, most commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis and systemic vasculitis. And I then, uh, back in the old days when you used to use Indicus Medicus uh, rather than PubMed, went and found uh, this uh, lecture by Mr Watson uh, about sort of how to look after scleral disease. And I thought this is really interesting and that's what I decided I'd work on because back then I needed to earn a living, uh, so I needed to work three days a week in private practice and then I thought I'll spend the other two days having some fun. So I got an honorary appointment at, uh, in immunology and ophthalmology at St Vincent's Hospital and with Dennis Wakefield we started an ocular immunology clinic. And so, you know, we got, did some sort of vague epidemiology work and wrote a review paper. I started to see all sorts of patients with terrible sort of eye wall rot from uh, of their sclera from these bad diseases and started to use some of the new treatments, IV methylpred and cyclosporin, which was a wonder drug uh, back then. But then uh, my life changed because the HIV epidemic came along and because I was at St Vincent's and St Vincent's was really the hospital where all of this started, uh, the epidemic started in Sydney, my clinic just got totally overrun with patients with CMV retinitis because there was no treatment, we didn't know what the cause of AIDS was, you know, it was the gay plague and there was enormous paranoia. Most of my colleagues didn't want to see patients with AIDS. Uh, several of my registrars refused to come to my clinic. And uh, these patients, essentially, if, if I saw that they had the CMV retinitis, uh, they knew they were going to die within three months. So it was a, a very stressful and very challenging time for all of us. Um, <coughs> And basically what happened was this disease, as the epidemic uh, sort of became more common, it took over my clinic. In the end, I was seeing two to three new patients with CMV retinitis uh, every week in my clinic. And at any one time, we were managing 50 or 60 patients uh, with this, this infection. And back then, you needed intravenous medication. We were also giving intraocular injections. And it was a, just an all-consuming uh, sort of disease. And as you know, it was very intensively researched. We found the cause, got a whole range of drug treatments. And and then eventually we had combination highly active retroviral therapy and it just converted the disease from a death sentence into another chronic infection. Uh, all my patients went away because patients didn't get so immunocompromised anymore and it's now just in a sense another chronic infection that we all look after and most of my patients with HIV infection now get uh, age related or premature onset age related macular degeneration and accelerated atherosclerosis from the drugs rather than having any bad eye disease. So uh, I sort of lived over basically about 15 years through a most extraordinary time in medicine. You know, it was at the real frontier of ophthalmology and medicine. We saw all these new eye diseases and systemic diseases we'd never seen before. I worked very closely with immunologists, haematologists. We developed collaborative care models, did a lot of clinical trial work. Uh, I found it was really far more emotionally and uh, physically demanding than anything else I'd ever done. And uh, it really made me a much better doctor. I became a much sadder doctor because a lot of my patients who are incredibly smart, intelligent uh, people, actors, uh, you know, uh, physicians, musicians, uh, uh, senior public servants, and a whole generation of them got wiped out. But I became, I think, a, a much wiser doctor and a much more empathetic physician and doctor and it really helped me to develop my skills uh, as a doctor. After that, <clears throat> I sort of felt I, I, needed, to, uh, I needed more training because I really didn't know what I was doing. So I sort of convinced my wife that it really wouldn't be a bad thing to move with my four children under the age of 10 to London for a year. <laughs> um, it really wouldn't destroy my private practice uh, and that, look, we had a few debts but the bank said that it'd be all right. So it turned out to be the best thing that we ever did as a family. 
Um, it took nearly 15 years to pay off the debt, but it was worth every cent. Uh, our family had a wonderful time living in London. I worked in sort of uh, eye, eye doctor's heaven. Uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital drains the population of Australia to its hospital, so we sort of saw everything. And uh, my mentor, Professor Lightman, in the white coat there, uh, she, we we uh, we're all well. She and I are, are very close friends. We've worked together ever since. All, all the fellows there, Hamish, Carlos, and Diana, are good friends of mine. We had it was just a life changing experience and one of the best things I ever did. And I'd encourage anybody at any time, as the other speakers have, to go and do this. It's just fantastic. It was the first of my many midlife crises. <laughs> so uh, while I was there, Mr. Watson did a scleritis clinic. So I used to go to that every week and see all just much more scleritis than I'd ever seen. We wrote a research paper looking at a, a, an uncommon form of that. And Mr. Watson really became uh, one of my mentors and close friends until he died. So then I went back, came back to Sydney, went back into private practice, did some research, got very depressed, that sort of post-fellowship depression that you get when you come back to Sydney from a place like London. <clears throat> and uh, I was really struggling, you know, to know what to do. And the then dean at New South Wales Uni, Bruce Doughton, said, you know, you know, there's an interesting job out at Liverpool. Maybe you should have to think about it, at least thinking about applying to it. So to cut a long story short, I left my private practice, took, was lucky enough to get this job at Liverpool and became the foundation professor of ophthalmology out there. And uh, it, was, uh, it was just, uh, I think it was Carol that was the intern at, uh, out, or was it you? You were the intern out at, uh, out at Bankstown and Campbelltown. Well, Liverpool was the other great frontier of uh, medicine, it's sort of a real war zone. Uh, I held the record for the most glassings in a week uh, for four years, sadly, at, uh, at Liverpool. But uh, it was fantastic ophthalmology and I had a fabulous time there and we started to develop a really good clinical unit. But then uh, Bruce Robinson called me and said he wanted to let me know that Frank Bilson had retired. And so, to cut a long story short, 30 years later, I was back at the eye hospital where they didn't want me. And uh, I've been there now, I actually started in March 2009. So it's just on uh, 10 years uh, since I, well, 10 years since I started there. And um, since then, we've, uh, I, I think we've had a fantastic sort of uh, period of growth and uh, excitement. Uh, we've built up the Research Institute. You can see in tiny letters the word equal, but we're one of the, the equal first ranked eye research institute in Australia. We're the sixth ranked eye research unit in the world. And uh, I've been lucky enough to build up the largest uveitis and inflammatory eye disease clinic in Australia. When I started my clinic, there was just myself and one registrar. We now have four consultants, three fellows and three registrars. And my aim is to make myself redundant from my clinic so I don't need to be there. We, I still do scleritis research. This is a paper that one of my uh, residents who did as his master's treatise and he's now on the training scheme that was published last year looking at different forms of scleritis across our region. I've helped to develop a new local uh, subconjunctival steroid treatment for scleritis. We've developed a little device that uh, is linked to, um, to the modern version of an IMED pump that continuously irrigates the ocular surface with antibiotics for patients with infective scleritis and that works uh, very well. And I've been lucky enough to live through that uh, great sort of um, a great era and revolution in inflammatory disease generally of the biologics and sort of multiple immunosuppressive drugs. And this is from uh, uh, my colleague Jane Bleasel and it just illustrates how rheumatology in the 80s was really all about sort of palliative type physical therapy and psychotherapy and supportive therapy because there really weren't any good drugs. And now with biologics, rheumatology, this patient's having his infleximab, he's just on his way between meetings having that and then we'll get on in with his life, no deformity and uh, in really robust good health. 
Um, we now use these biologics uh, where we are uh, in our uveitis clinics. We've set up multidisciplinary clinics. This is an example of our paediatric uh, uveitis clinic where we get Devinder Singh and Jeff Chato to come along to, uh, to our clinic. We get all the different sort of subspecialties of ophthalmology that we need to look after children with complex uh, uveitis, so glaucoma specialists, uh, cornea and, uh, and, uh, uh, and sometimes retina specialists. And we get everybody to come to the same place. The patient and their family get seen in the one venue rather than going to six practices. And it's really improved uh, our care of these children enormously. We thought we'd only see five patients every two months. We now see 20 patients uh, a clinic, and uh, that's the problem with these clinical things. They take over your life as they get busier. As I said, our, uh, our adult uveitis clinic has uh, sort of blossomed. We see between 80 and 90 patients every Wednesday morning. We have a rheumatologist and his advanced training who comes Tony Semmel, who comes to our, our clinic on a, a regular basis. And uh, we look after this extraordinary uh, sort of uh, group of patients with complex vision-threatening inflammatory eye disease. And we can get access to all the latest sort of systemic immunosuppressive and biologic drugs. And it's just changed uh, the way we look after these patients and uh, their prognosis. So I guess over my time as an ophthalmologist, I sort of did a very meandering course like the other speakers this morning. I was privileged enough with my friend and fellow uh, Carlos Pavazio, who we were fellows together, to to edit the uh, the third edition of Peter Watson's book on the sclera. And now that Peter's no longer with us, I'm not quite, and the publisher's gone bankrupt. I'm not sure whether <laughs> there'll be another edition, but. It was just sort of part of my journey to go from student to being able to contribute, and I, I found that really uh, a wonderful uh, thing to do. But as all the other speakers have said, although we've taken sort of unusual and different and meandering roads, none of us have travelled alone. We've all, uh, you know, my mentor Ron Penny, my good friend and mentor Sue Lightman and Peter Watson, I've got uh, colleagues, ophthalmologists, uh, immunologists, rheumatologists around the world that are all good friends that we see each other regularly. My children have stayed at quite a few of their places as well, like Carol's children. It's a, a really good network of people uh, that you can call on, and certainly their children have stayed at our house. And I, and I think the thing, one of the many things that I've learned is that, as Helen Keller said, although alone we can each do a little, together we can do so much more. And really the strength of uh, collaboration and friendship and, and sharing uh, the challenges that we all have has made a huge difference to my life. I work with lots and lots of people all over Sydney, and that's really been one of the great joys, I think, of my professional life, to, to be able to be a, what I think is a real doctor and look after patients with uh, multi-system disease, as well as uh, you know, help people to retain their vision and, and to restore vision uh, with some of the many uh, complex eye diseases that we look after. So in finishing, I just want to share with you a couple of sayings that I think are important. And certainly uh, this saying from Mark Twain that, you know, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than the ones that you did. And uh, I think I always tried to sort of take advantage of any door that was opened rather than regretting the one that was closed. And uh, every, uh, every sort of journey that I've taken has been terrific. And uh, I think it's really important to focus on the journey, not the destination. You know, the real joy is not finishing something, but actually in doing it. And you can take risks safely. This one of my friends invited me to Israel earlier this year to talk at a meeting and uh, the university sends us all travel advisories when we travel. <laughs> and uh, it told me I wasn't allowed to uh, go within five kilometres of a border. So the border is that little white line over there. And uh, I've got a photograph of me on every border uh, except the Gaza Strip in Israel. With I've been to Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. I've got a photograph uh, at each border to show uh, the vice chancellor. I'm on the Israeli side of the uh, the wire fence there at the minefield, so it is possible to take risks uh, safely and to enjoy it. 
But I think, as everyone else has said, your family is the most important thing and that's the thing that you really need to always make time for. And I'm very lucky. I've now got uh, three and three-quarter grandchildren, four kids and a very happy uh, family. So it's been a wonderful sort of journey that I've had. I feel really privileged to be able to share it with all of you. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you.